we, we wanted to shine a light, however, on some of the aspects um, that can impact adoptees and their adoptive parents. But as will become clear, any child that has been relinquished. So we, we would be doing a great disservice to everyone if we didn't make clear that although our talk is called the unacknowledged grief in adoption, we're not inferring by that title that adoption causes grief. What can and often does cause grief, though it isn't always experienced or shows up as grief, um, is, is perhaps dissociation from relinquishment. And of course, relinquishment always precedes adoption. So tonight we're looking at relinquishment through the lens of adoption, but much of our discussion is going to apply to those in care who've been fostered and even seeking asylum. The data suggests that adoptees are at higher risk of suicide, um, higher risk than those who are not adopted. So we wanted as a suicide prevention organisation to take a deep look at that this evening and consider if there's anything more that needs to be teased apart here, anything that maybe is overlooked, anything that gets swept under this all consuming label of adoption that might more readily explain why adoptee teens are at higher risk than their peers to attempted suicide. So a loss of connection has a significant impact on humans. I think we all know that when we're not connected to our purpose, our values, to the people that we love, we can begin to unravel. Adoption, being in care, being conceived through sperm donation are all rooted in relinquishment and that means loss. That loss can create grief and when grief is unacknowledged, sometimes because it's not recognised as possible. For example, the child was only a few days old, how can they have such a complex emotion? Or because the situation in which they're now in is perceived to be so much better that we don't even consider grief to be part of the conversation. Um, and so this evening I am so honoured that we have such a wonderful panel. So um, we have Ron, Zara and Debbie, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and why it was important for them to be here. So um, just because it's the order in which I can see you, Zara, do you want to, can I let you introduce yourself to everyone? Okay. Hi, my name is Zara Phillips. I am an adoptee in Reunion and I, with both birth uh, families, and I have been writing about my experience for the last 20 years. So I'm an author of a couple of books um, and a musician. I sing about it, write about it, act about it. Basically, that's what I do <laughs> and talk about it. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for being here. Thank, oh, you. Yeah, thank you. And Ron, thank you for being here. Do you want to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Hi, everybody. My name's Ron and I have been involved in relinquishment and adoption probably for the last 25 years. Um, I've been very curious about what happens to a baby when the baby or young child loses its mother and its father by birth. And um, I've always been intrigued by uh, that study. So my story is a story of studying that. Um, I've served as a pastor. I ran a counseling center and I was a teacher. Um, all, all those different things together are involved in my history with this. And I've written a couple of books about it because my interest continues. Enough said. Um, Debbie, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Debbie Doherty and I'm the adoptive mum of a 17 year old girl. And um, I recently started volunteering with the Ollie Foundation. I went to one of their courses and I thought it was fantastic. And so I wanted to join them and see if I could contribute. And I think um, the idea about unacknowledged grief and loss in adoption, um, it's a tricky subject for people to get their heads around. Um, people don't want to know, they want the happy ever after story. And just because children are in a happy adoption, that doesn't cancel out any loss and grief they feel. So it doesn't have to be one or the other, both things can coincide at the same time. Thank you for that point, Debbie. That's a really good place to start. And, and actually, the, if we could start right back at the beginning and, and Ron, the first question we were going to consider this evening was, what do we actually know about the experience 
uh, for babies in relation to separation and grief. Is, is that something that you've looked at before? Certainly so. Um, Thomas Verney wrote a book, The, um, the Secret Life of the Unborn Child. Thank you, Zara. And he makes reference to that question quite a bit. But let's just notice that at 24 weeks of age, the first sound that all of us hear is the sound of our mother's heartbeat. And there is a prenatal life that's going on and developing. Um, and even before birth, um, there's the capacity to hear voices and to take note of the calm or the anxiety of the mother who's soon to give birth. Um, after even 10 days of age, an infant can um, determine the difference between the milk of the breast milk of its, of its mother as opposed to another mother. And the in, in, infant constantly turns its head in that direction towards its birth mom. So we can't, um, we, we, there's things we can't prove about it, but what a mistake to not think that um, even infants are dealing with fear and anxiety when there's an exchange of parents. Um, grief is a complicated uh, process developmentally, but the first experience even of the neonate or the infant is the, the experience of disruption in such a way that is frightening. Uh, we need to have a secure place to begin our lives, and when there's an exchange of parents, sometimes infants experience that in a way that creates a certain kind of fear. So in terms of early development, um, we have some data that suggests that yes, there's a real person dealing with a real, uh, a, a real difficult moment. And um, that moves into something that I'll only mention and then uh, go back to Debbie. But because of that, the adoptee, um, develops with a partial sense of self, a partial sense of self because of the loss of its birth parents. And we'll talk more about that this evening, but um, that's kind of where things are heading in terms of development for an adoptee, and there are challenges along that road. Thank you, Ron. Debbie Zara, before we say anything more is there anything you wanted to add to that from your own experience or the learning that you've done well i would like to say that the thing that always baffles me about the whole adoption topic is that people don't seem to understand that um <clears throat> babies you know know so much before they're even born and I think, um, you know, also I'm a mother too, so I could really understand that once I became a mother, a lot of my um, connections with it all really, I could put more words to it. But, you know, babies, um, they don't start with a blank slate. Even if, even babies that are kept, you know, I always feel like there's such a journey just in, in utero. So, um, I wish that people would, would give more credit to babies for all the knowledge that they have. And, and they know, you know, they've done so many different, uh, what's the word, experiments where they know that babies kick, you know, to certain music, um, babies know voices during utero. Um, I know as a mother that I could sense even the, the, um, the nature of my child and I was actually right. You know, you just know who they are. So, um, and when a baby is born, the mother is there to regulate the baby. You know, that's what the, it's just nature. And when the baby's laid on the mother's chest, the synapses in the brain start fusing. And so when that's broken, things happen, you know, immediately. I mean, I can talk more personally about that as well, you know, as a mother and just really getting that experience. But but it's just a fact, it's what happens. Okay. You know, animals do not give away their babies. They know you would never take a puppy away. You're always told you cannot pick this puppy up for six weeks or eight weeks. Why with the human baby are we told you can have the baby the moment it's born? Animals know way more. They're very smart. We should be listening to the animal kingdom. So, you know, there's so much I can say about that. So 
I wonder if there's any more to be said about the nonverbal element. So if the if the experience of, of that infant comes at a time where they have no language, what happens to those feelings? Does it where do they go? Are they imprinted somewhere? How do we know anything more about that? Well, I could say, I mean, they know about cellular memory. We know that babies do panic as well. You know, when the mother's out of sight, the baby does not know it's a separate being for months. Um, so if the mother's gone, it feels like death. The baby thinks it's going to die. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, Ron, you can maybe talk more about the um, other part of that. But, you know. Thank you. Ron, would you like to come in? Um, I'm not I'm not sure I can add that much to it. I know that in terms of preparing for tonight's presentation, I've, I've thought about how important it is for adoptive parents to understand that their children are growing up on a different developmental path. It is different in an almost lifelong way. Um, you know, we talk about relinquishment and adoption as moments in time, but really they are both processes that continue on throughout life. Both of them have meaning to the adoptee. And so I mentioned earlier, a partial sense of self is something that adoptive parents need to know about. And um, in terms of our conversation here, adoptees themselves need to have some self understanding of the challenges that they face in part because society, at least historically, has really confused uh, the adoptee as if to say you're not supposed to have those feelings and obviously uh, they are there um, and you asked earlier well where do they go um, if it's too painful to know if it's if something is too painful to know our minds have the capacity to repress and push away and kind of dis disassociate is a good word there uh, with feelings that are too painful to know but when you grow up with a partial sense of self because you don't know who you are completely, um, that makes the challenge of grieving, we're talking about grief tonight, the challenge of grieving is itself a developmental achievement. A child has to be connected enough, attached enough to its adoptive parents, mom and dad both, so that the child develops the capacity to uh, feel the feelings that are part of this early interruption in life and that capacity is sometimes lacking and if it's lacking in a in a really significant way children have struggles adopting their parents if a child has a problem adopting its parents uh, there's again that partial sense of self at play and that child will then um, have a struggle in terms of allowing the sadness that's part of loss to develop and come up. When that loss is um, acknowledged and experienced, then it's okay to be sad. And so one of the things adoptive parents need to take away from tonight is the importance of saying to themselves and to their children, it's okay to be sad. Because as good adoptive parents, we need to carry the load with them so they share that sadness. And I'm sure adoptive parents can speak to that in terms of carrying sadness with their children. Debbie, I'm gonna to come to you. I feel uh, One of the books that um, we were asked to read was The Primal Wound by Nancy, um, yeah. Nancy Berrier. And it talks about the primal wound and that goes back to some of the things that have already been mentioned. Um, and the, the idea that um, the baby does carry this memory, even when they're pre-verbal, pre they've got the memory without being able to express it. So um, with my daughter, it showed as um, really intense separation anxiety when she was little. She really didn't want to leave my side. Um, we talked about her being the Velcro baby because she was so attached. Um, and when she had, um, you know, toddler meltdowns, they were really big. And, you know, you can, I could see the anger in there. Um, she was really uncomfortable being um, apart from me. Um, 
and I think that was the fear of you know losing a, another attachment because she'd already lost her birth mother and family she'd been in a children's home for a short while and so you know I was her probably third main carer or more um, and she was obviously very frightened by that and very frightened about the chance of losing losing that I'm so interested Debbie in this experience of emotion that we have no language for and the and the mystery of that so when we when something happens and, and we find it very ups, upsetting and unsettling not necessarily being able to comment as to why or have any knowledge of why and and, and so presumably then there's a lot of um uh support that's needed from, from someone like yourself to be able to label it to name it yeah definitely i think um I think fortunately, you know, we go through a very rigorous um, home study report and training program and there's books to read. And, you know, my husband and I went into it quite naively thinking, you know, oh, we've got a loving home. It would be lovely to have a, another baby. And, um, you know, the first training course I went on, the first thing they said is love is not enough because the, um, you've really got to try and understand the background that these children have, have gone through. And of course you can't understand it because you haven't been through it yourself. So you can just do your level best. And I remember things from those early training courses and books coming back later as she grew up and I could see she needed things. So, you know, fortunately we had the training background so that we could, you know, start to, as you were saying, actually work with her, even as a toddler, talking about adoption before she even knew the words I was saying, so that I was comfortable talking to her about where she came from and life story books made up of photographs to start with, and then starting to build a life story book together and helping to give her the vocabulary for these feelings that she was having. And, you know, it's ongoing. Well, I was just thinking about something because we're talking about grief. So I was thinking to make it really easy for people to think about in a visual way. For us as adoptees, okay, for example, me, you know, born to a teenage mother in the 60s, nobody knew. So when you think about it just like this, a teenage mother giving birth by herself, her parents went with her, there's no balloons, there's no celebration. It's a secret. That is how we come into the world. And when you really think about a baby, the first thing I think is the joy, right? The joy, the blooms, the excitement, let's make a cake, let's have a baby shower. So we're coming from the beginning in utero. Our, our mothers are pretending they're not pregnant often because they're so terrified. So all that stuff is, what does that do to, to us, you know, immediately we we know from the very moment of conception we're not really supposed to be here you know so i think it's easy when people think of it that way as the relinquishment i mean we were talking about this the other day and you know adoption is one thing and as an adoptee people will always say how wonderful like when i was a child oh my god you must be so grateful you know and i'd stand there and think I don't feel grateful. I don't, what's wrong with me? Why don't I feel grateful? I really should, but I really don't. But I mustn't tell anybody because if I tell you I'm not feeling grateful, you're going to take me back to some children's home or something. And, you know, it's to really think about adoption is to think about the relinquishment piece. We were all relinquished. And, you know, with Debbie's daughter, she's um, an international adoptee, but we, and where our ages are completely different, but we connect because we share and there are no words to explain what it feels like that your mother gave you away. For me, there's no word, there were no words as a child except I felt terribly sad, but I couldn't say that I felt sad because everyone was telling me how lucky I was. So that's when I believe, and that's why the unacknowledged grief was something I was so passionate of talking about is adoption starts adoption is only formed from loss really the loss of you know the, the adoptee has lost its mother often not always but often an adoptive mother maybe not or parents might not be able to have a children so they might be infertile so they've lost 
their fantasy of their child um, and the birth mother has lost their baby so it's formed from loss so for me that's so obvious for me as an adoptee but yet for so many people they don't even think about that they just think about the adoption but they're not thinking about the relinquishment part which came before the adoption and you've mentioned that the other players in 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 this in this scene uh that also have significant grief um would anyone on the panel like to talk a little bit more about the grief of uh the birth mother the adoptive parent i'd like to make a comment about um the work i've done with birth mothers is that it, it, it informs me because i'm learning every time i listen informs me that healthy birth mothers never get over it that is to say the loss of their child um, one out of three birth mothers never have another baby um, mm -hmm. this is powerful powerful loss for the birth mother um, and that the, the the birth mother story is a story where you learn to cope with something that doesn't go away um, i'm involved right now in a reunion uh, the, the 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 birth son is 35 years old and the birth mom is about 16 years older and he has all his life carried uh his concern about his relinquishment and she that is to say his birth mother told him last week that for the last 35 years she's prayed for him every day when um birth mothers are able to just let it go and forget about it the, I, I see that as a developmental arrest of some sort because you don't get over this kind of a loss the baby never i'm saying it in poor english okay the baby never doesn't matter the baby always matters even if it's relinquished that little boy that little girl will always be important to that birth mother we need to notice tonight that we are tampering with the most important relationship on earth between a mother and its child. And that tampering has some challenges that we need to acknowledge. And, and Zara did a good job of laying out the reality of what it's like to be relinquished and to even know that not, I, not even the day that you were born, but the day you were conceived, you're, um, you feel like an optional person because um, your, your birthright has been tampered with. And that's what adoptees are dealing with when they um, move forward in their own development. And you know what, counseling, counseling with adoptees is really an invitation to the adoptee to seek his or her voice and learn his or her truth and accept that even if it's painful. Enough said for now. Thank you, Ron. Debbie, can I ask if there's anything you wanted to add at this point? Um, I don't think there is really, Debbie. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to move the conversation forward a little bit. I have noticed there are quite a few questions in the chat around birth mothers and people are quite interested in that. Zara, Ron, I know, um, although Zara, you're here at the moment, but you're both uh, based in the US. The, the number you gave, Ron, is, is, is that a, a, a number that's relevant to the US only or is that a, a more uh, global figure? You know, I, I know that I don't know the answer to that question. I know that in my training and in my research over the years, it's always come up that um, birth mothers often never have another baby because it has been so painful to relinquish uh, the first child that was, was born. But can I just say that if I was just thinking, you know, and I've heard other adoptees say this too, so I know I'm not on my own, but I actually believed I mean, Ron saying that, you know, so many birth mothers, they say they thought about their child. I actually thought my mother would forget that she had me and that I would not be remembered. Mm. And I remembered saying to the social worker and I was reuniting, what if she doesn't remember? You know, and this woman's like, I think she's going to remember having a baby. But that was really how I thought about adoption, that you were just sort of given away and not, you know, there was no name. I didn't know if I had a name. I just felt like it, I was just probably like a number, you know, with a bunch of babies. 
And then you find out, well, that's not true at all. My birth mother thought about me all the time. And that's all part of the unacknowledged grief, you know, stuff that little adoptees don't tell their adopted parents. Am I remembered? Did you think she forgot, you know, has forgotten about me, etc. And those are the conversations I think little adoptees need to be told. You know, it's not obvious to us. You know, mm -hmm. tell your child, yes, your mother, that's a very hard thing that your mother had to do. Sometimes grown ups have to make really difficult decisions. Um, you know, make it always part of the conversation because as children, I mean, we know that children just use, you You know, we use our imagination. If you're not told, you're going to make up a story. And let me tell you, as an adoptee, the story is never going to be good because we feel like we shouldn't be here. So we're never going to make up a great story about our beginnings. So, and I see somebody has said something about birth mothers blocking, um, or, you know, they block out the day it's traumatic and some birth mothers don't want to reunite. And again, I think it's all part of the unacknowledged grief because it is so hard for them to go there. You know, so they'd rather not sometimes meet because then they're going to have to really relive that trauma. And what often happens in reunion is when we do meet, or if we do get to meet our birth mothers, her traumas, you know, reignited the bait, you know, I'm, I was wanting my mother to fix me. She was wanting me to fix her. Nobody, I didn't know. I didn't understand about that. I mean, that's a whole, we could do a whole thing on just reunion in itself. But again, it's because we haven't dealt with the grief individually before we all can, come together. So there's one more point that I'd like to um, bring out before we sort of try and tie things up a little bit. Ron, when we were talking the other day, we, we were talking about the different roles that an adopted child might have to fill. Um, and Zara just reminded me that of that when she was speaking just then. Um, and, and to all on our panel, I wonder if there's anything that you would like to say. Um, so Zara, I've got the sense, and I don't want to speak for you, but I had the sense there of some of the things you were saying around being compliant, being grateful, being not ever asking questions that might be tricky because you might be given back. You, 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 and uh, Debbie, Ron, I don't know if you would like to add to this um, discussion. Well, I, I, um, I did look over some notes uh, from stuff I've written in the past about the different roles that um, adoptees are asked to play in their adoptive families. And all of this relates to the grieving piece in the sense that the roles I'm going to describe um, disallow grieving and they disallow the, uh, the genuine voice of the adoptee because it's an expectation put upon them in terms of family dynamics. Um, and I'll be really brief about them. Uh, the first, of course, is that um, the, the, the adoptee is a representation of joy. In other words, a lot of happiness goes around with uh, be forming a family through adoption. And so the experience of the adoptee is, I am supposed to be happy, but I'm supposed to be happy all the time because my job is to represent that joy to these adoptive parents. And so the child, the adoptee doesn't feel the freedom to be sad. I want you to see that there's a role that the adoptee is playing by representing the happiness and joy that comes along with adoption. Adoption is the relationship between the adoptee and his or her adoptive parents. Well, that joy looks like a wonderful thing until it becomes an expectation. And the expectation is you shouldn't be sad, uh, you should be thankful, um, as, as Zara said earlier. I'll just give you a few others and then I'll stop again. Um, sometimes the, this is a big one, sometimes the the infant, the adoptee, is a representation of sadness. Mm. This is no fun, but it's a representation of the grief that's unacknowledged. Um, we often say in the adoption world, adoption is not a solution to infertility. Adoption is not a solution to infertility in terms of forming a family. Um, adoption is that relationship with the adoptive parents but the, uh, the, the adoptive parents still have to grieve whatever they've lost. And you know, so clearly with infertility, there's the loss of the, what I call wished for child. 
and instead the adoptee um, has to ser serve a certain, certain role with the adoptive parents. And so um, sometimes the child is supposed to represent sadness. And um, th that's quite troubling because who wants to do that? But if the child represents the sadness around infertility, because adoptive moms didn't grieve it, they just made sure that this child was a replacement child. That's another role that adoptees don't want to play, replacing the, 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 the wish for child that I mentioned. And then quite briefly, uh, let me just make a comment about guilt and about shame. Guilt is um, sometimes what a child is asked, the role of the child is asked to represent guilt because the adoptive, the, the birth parents look and they see a guilt about the conception and a guilt about the, the, uh, the, the birth of a child in such a way that the child represents, um, you know, behavior that someone is, is uh, feeling guilty about. More importantly, with regard to the, the role I'll finally make a comment about, what's it like to grow up as an adoptee and represent embarrassment and shame? The way birth mothers were treated years ago was just horrible because the representation of shame, um, the child represented shame in such a way that um, birth mothers, for example, um, you know, were treated so poorly in the homes that they were required to go to when they gave birth to their child and relinquished that child. Being a representation of shame and embarrassment is a horrible thing for anybody to carry. But sometimes adoptees will report that that's how they saw their, the role that they were playing in their adoptive families. So whatever expectations are put upon an adoptee, that are so unfair and negative, that adoptee has to carry that. As a result, it's very difficult for the adoptee to be genuine, to be forthcoming with who he or she really is. Um, the way I like to say it sometimes is to get fully inside her own voice. All these expectations get in the way of that. And that's why it's so important for adoptive parents to wonder what is it like for their child to be that person? I just, I just want to add something because we're talking about unacknowledged grief and how right. that works out to piggyback with what Ron's saying. So what do you, you know, when for me and when I, I work with other teenage adoptees, you know, what happens when we're not allowed to grieve? It's going to come out somewhere. And I really do believe that the anger which you can see in teens that are acting out and the drugs and the alcohol and the self-harm is all tied in with not being allowed to grieve. That's just my personal opinion and I feel like my personal experience was because, as Ron was saying, there was no voice and nowhere for me to go to say, I feel sad all the time, I don't know what's wrong with me, I don't understand why I'm supposed to be happy and I don't feel it and I have to play this role and I can't keep the role up. So I'm going to pivot around and I'm going to explode, you know, so I'm going to act out and I'm going to hurt myself. And what makes me so sad, you know, is that so many of us self harm, you know, like we, we feel all the grief and the loss and it's not our fault how we came in, how we came into existence and then we hurt ourselves. That's just so sad instead of, you know, what would be more helpful, I feel, is allowing the teen to grieve or having somebody around to notice that. When we did that radio show, there were things that Zara was saying and my daughter was just nodding along. And um, it was like Zara saying she was never comfortable doing sleepovers as a child. And, and Ella was saying, well, that's me, that's me. Um, and again, it's that separation anxiety. So the feelings, the, the loss of birth family, you know, whether the child, whether the baby was relinquished um, voluntarily or whether circumstance, circumstances in the society or whatever meant that that child was separated from their birth families. You know, whatever the reason, the, um, those, 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 that, 
loss of birth family, you know, we could see the same issues created, even though they were, you know, a few decades apart. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think the difference that we were talking about was that, you know, Zara's mum and dad, when they adopted Zara, I, I don't know how much training they got, but I would imagine at that time, it would be, you know, oh, you need a baby, here's a baby, off you go, it'll be fine. And just denying all of this. And I think the, the difference now is that although my daughter's gone through a lot of the things that Zara's described, the difference is that we were more briefed to look out for it and try and, you know, walk with her through it. And I remember her grieving really hard in junior school i think she was about seven or eight and you know school would tell me that she you know she just sat at her desk and cried and she didn't know why so you know we were doing the life story work and at that time and everything and it, you know it's just trying to get her to accept that it's it's understandable why but she she had no idea where it was coming from and I just quickly wanted to say about roles as well, because um, for my daughter, she's kind of, she hasn't as yet gone down the sort of um, self-medicating route of drugs and alcohol and things like that. And hopefully she won't. But um, the way she responded was a sense of um, trying to be the, the perfect child and follow the rules and be good and do what's expected of her and those expectations she took on herself and they became her self expectations and she put herself under so much pressure to do the right thing all the time and you know work hard at school etc that that you know that that has caused her problems so it's it's the sense of she was you know so it's this, i think underneath it all it's obviously i don't want to be rejected again but it was also, she said once, about she wanted to prove to her birth parents that they shouldn't have abandoned her. We don't have the full story of what happened, but um, she wants to prove to them that she was worthwhile and that they should have tried to keep her. And um, so it's that sense of low self-esteem despite everything we've done. You know, it's that low self-esteem that underpins a lot of these insecurities. Now, somebody I was seeing in the message box is asking, um, you know, how do you make an adoptee go there to grieve, you know, if they don't want to? And I, I, you can't. I mean, not every adoptee is going to, to follow the same pattern. And I, I just think it's just good to acknowledge it's a lifelong impact the grief has come up for me my whole life to this point um various you know milestone moments becoming a mother myself my adopted mother passing away those milestones just would bring up the grief in such a profound way so i don't think we can you know some of us it just shows younger and i think other adoptees you, you just cope with it in different ways but i just think it's important to have the conversation and say to them you know you might not feel the grief now you might say you can't remember and also you know we know how to protect ourselves as human beings if, if you don't want to go there and it's too much it's almost like the brain will say no they're not you know we're not ready yet um so but but i just think having the conversation you know, if there's no conversation about any of it, there's no chance in, in uh, working through it. That's just my, my feeling. Let me make a, a comment at this point um, about, um, well, the question was about how do you make a child grieve? You cannot make a child grieve, but you can invite, the, you can invite that uh, grieving process. And you do it by constantly referencing and talking about the birth parent story, always saying positive things about birth parents, because when you're saying something positive about a birth parent, you're saying positive about a child. And so adoptive parents can invite the grief. But I want to take just a moment to tie this into the other side of the story here, 
which is the question is around suicide. And as, as you were talking, I thought one way to define suicide is that suicide is about an inability to grieve, an inability to come to terms with the realities that have to be faced. And that suicide itself might be thought of as a final relinquishment of oneself. Suicide is a final relinquishment. I've never said that before or even thought it, but that's kind of how we might think about it. Uh, and if suicide is an inability to grieve, which we're talking about, um, that, that grieving process has to happen. And if it gets stuck and that grief is never managed, what does it turn into? Um, it was referenced earlier. I think, I think it turns into a lot of anger. And I see, I think about suicide in some ways as the expression of a lot of rage, even if uh, it looks like despair and, dis and depression and sadness. When you look at all the damage that is done uh, when someone succeeds at suicide, you look around the room or you look in the church at the funeral, you see how many people that uh, that child hurt by taking his or her life. So there's a, there's a, a dimension to suicide which is um, so, so powerful and so, so, so dangerous. And, uh, and it hurts so many people. Well, if it hurts so many people, that may be the original unconscious intention of the behavior. So I think that the connection between grieving well and not becoming suicidal is really rather direct. I think you've <laughs> we're all taking that in, Ron. Um, that was quite powerful to think through. Zara, Debbie, I know, obviously I'm working in suicide prevention all the time, but I, I wonder in your experiences whether suicide has ever been something that you've had to consider or think about. Well, I used to think about suicide a lot. You know, I didn't care whether I lived or died um, and I would take drugs and I never asked what they were. And I would think about it as I was doing it. I wonder if this would, would kill me, you know, and I self-harmed. I did all that stuff. So I definitely had the experience of, you know, of, of not wanting to be around and not caring and not thinking anybody else would care either. You know, again, that whole thing of, I don't really matter, I'm not important. No one's gonna remember me, all this stuff. And you know, I've asked friends over the years, <laughs> do you remember me if you didn't see me for a year? And they're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it took me like years. I mean, it sounds so wacky, but I know other adoptees out there are gonna, gonna understand what I'm saying. Um, you know, on the suicide thing, so my daughter's had um, a rough few years recently and I'm pleased to say she's in a much better place now through a combination of uh, school, uh, negotiating with school to take some pressure off and some therapeutic work done with Link Bernardo's and um, medication, uh, some antidepressants. And she's now functioning really well. And I wanted to say that because what I say next is quite hard so she's um at her lowest points in the last um three to four years um she has had suicidal thoughts and feelings and she has sometimes acted on that um so we've had to sort of whip her off to hospital and um what I wanted to say was, you know, that was so scary as a parent the first time that happened, as you can, um, I'm sure, understand. Um, but as we got to understand more about what was behind it, it became much easier or much, slightly less hard to deal with. Um, and I say that because it's so important to have this conversation about suicide. It's, it's so important to say the word um because it's such a relief you know if i it, you know when i got to the point where i could say to her oh are you are you having suicidal thoughts and feelings right now she could then openly say to me either yes i am or no it was just a bad day i'm feeling low and it's really important to understand where they are um and once we'd um 
when we were dealing with these um, crises, crisis points, um, she did explain to us, um, mostly she would say, I wasn't thinking about dying. I just wanted all of this to stop. She was so overwhelmed with trying to um, just deal with life, I suppose being a teenager, the adoption issues, perceived pressure from school, a lot of pressure that she put on herself. And it was just so overwhelming. She wanted that to stop. That was the main driver. So when we could start, start to unpick all these feelings, we could really, really make progress. Um, mm. And it's just, you know, these, what we learned was this is, um, you know, the self-harm and and having suicidal thoughts and feelings, they are on this suicide spectrum. But don't be frightened of that word because actually it's a really it's a real relief for them to be able to talk about it. And and for everyone listening today, if you weren't aware of the Ollie Foundation before and, and just it was this talk that brought us to your attention, we, we offer a range of suicide prevention training um, that, that is often fully funded. And it does just what Debbie uh, was talking about there. It gives you the tools to have those conversations without being fearful. So I just want to recap because we've got three really important sort of different views. So, you know, Ron's assertion um, that possibly suicide is, is, is this outward unconscious harm to others, pain, anger. Zara is talking about, I really didn't think anyone would care or notice. Um, it sounded like you were quite um, numb, unsure, and, and actually it, you were just playing Russian roulette. But, but Debbie, I'm, I'm interested in what you've just added to the conversation because in most of our trainings at Oli, what we try and educate, um, what we say to people from the knowledge we have is that not always, but very much most of the time, it is not that somebody wants to die. They just don't know how to continue living the way things are. And those two things are not the same. Um, so people can be thinking about suicide uh, and it is the death or the ending of, of, of what's paining them that they want to achieve. Um, they, they don't really want to end their lives. And I also think to consider that shame, the shame in, in adoption, and I know so many of us have carried this terrible shame. Um, and people will, you know, would say, oh, you're so oversensitive. But I think, again, that's just part of the adoption experience. So things are just taken in such a deep level um, around, you know, the not. So again, can create maybe the suicidal feelings as well because just the shame piles up, piles up. When we were all chatting the other day, there was another aspect that we wanted to consider, and and I know um, Ron, we were talking about other um, and, and Zara, you've already mentioned this sort of recycling of 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 the grief and who I am and and those life events that that brought things up that you may have thought you dealt with but Ron I wondered if you wanted to add anything because we were talking about what were there any implications that that we could be more mindful of for the adult adoptee in terms of the relationships they have uh with their life partner with their children and I know Zara you can speak to this as well but I'll, I'll just come to you after Ron um let me make a couple comments about it I, I have an idea where what you're talking about um, in our relationships as adults, part of, part of the baggage that we bring, bring to our relationships, marriage is just one example of it, we bring baggage to these relationships. And in fact, we sometimes distort people. And, and you know, after several years of marriage, my wife, I'm making, uh, making comments to my wife that don't, she doesn't deserve. But I'm unfinished with my conversations with the mother that may have hurt me or the father that may have hurt me. And so we distort in relationships. We create enemies so that we can deal with what we never finished dealing with. So, for example, an adoptee may get married to somebody who is what we call a pet rock. In other words, not a lot of jazz, not a lot of excitement, 
but the security of knowing that this person is never going to leave me. I'm secure in the relationship. Or sometimes um, we, we, we get in a relationship and we say, you're going you're gonna to leave me, aren't you? And then our partner says, no, I'm not going to leave you. And then we say, you're going to leave me, aren't you? And then my the partner says, no, I'm not. And the third time, you're going to leave me, aren't you? And the partner says, well, maybe I am. If you get my sense of the drama that gets going in relationships, because someone has never finished the grieving that we're talking about today. If people have not come to terms with the, the sorrows and the angers in their hearts, they will act them out in current relationships. Most of the counseling work I've done has been with relinquished and adopted adults. And to whatever degree either of them play in that developmental story, um, if it's not dealt with, if it's not finished, so to speak, or if you not come to terms and face reality, that's going to inform and distort in relationships so that we start picking on people that we get really close to because we haven't finished dealing with it. And what's so important about this whole conversation is we are connecting grief, not necessarily simply with suicide, but with difficult life. We're connecting grief today with how hard it is to make your life work. When I say, when you, don't, you, you have a partial sense of who you are and you're not clear about your own identity. And so those struggles feed into adult relationships. And, and it's tragic, but that often happens. Thank so, you. Um, I'm sort of laughing. I'm like, well, I'm the textbook adoptee that's divorced. Don't ask me about relationships. And <laughs> in fact, all my adoptee friends in the group, we all got divorced. That's pretty sad, isn't it? But we're all trying again in different relationships. <laughs> Hopefully we've learned a lot. But yeah, absolutely acted all that stuff out. Absolutely. That's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> I think um, one thing, you know, I keep wanting to tie in, in, in the grief. So I just want to say, because I know we're coming to the end of, of, of the talk part, but reunion me, is the beginning of the grief experience. So when people, um, you know, when adopted, you, we're not, you know, we're not ready to, um, to go there. You know, some adoptees are not ready to go there. There's a lifelong impact and reunion can profoundly bring up the grief. I think it is the beginning of the grieving. And I never realized what was happening wow. during my reunion. That, that, you know, even the searching, the searching before you even meet is the beginning of the grieving. Um, and I want to talk, and adopted parents have often, when I say, what is the least bit of adoption that you understood, you know, before, uh, and then you've become an adopted parent, they will always say the level of grief that my child has, like I never understood it. So that's another piece. And then I just want to say the, um, talking about the cellular memory thing, when I was pregnant, I had thought I had dealt with some stuff. But again, the cellular memory experience for me, you know, I'm pregnant, keeping my baby. I am, and I know my birth mother, and I am having nightmares that my baby's being taken away from me, um, that it disappears. Um, so I'm waking up howling in the night. I mean, I'm not on drugs or anything. You know, this is just naturally what my body is doing. And then when my child was born, I remember, you know, we were having this conversation the other, the other day. And I remember looking at him and, you know, all the love that we always feel and, and thinking, Oh my God, this is what I've never known. This connection, I have never, this is what has been missing. It's right in one moment I knew what I had been missing because of this connection I felt with this baby. I'd never experienced it before. And, you know, I had other adoptees. I wrote a lot about the motherhood parts because it was very profound. Um, and the cellular memory stuff during that time I mean, I literally thought I was crazy. Luckily, I had a really good therapist who knew who was adopted and knew about adoption and was able to explain to me, this is the cellular memory. You'll just re-experience what happened. You're going to be okay. You're going to be safe. 
I told my baby, you're going to be safe. Mom just has to go through a few things. Um, you know, so it comes up. It's so important. I get so emotional. Um, it's just so important to get the support because you don't you don't always understand and when I wrote about my experience as a mother so many adoptees wrote to me and just said oh my god this is what happened to me and uh, the adoptive mother's grief can come up at that time as well and my adoptive mother's grief came up about not being able to have a baby but she couldn't say it to me and so she was very angry with me and I got pregnant, I have three kids, and she was very angry. And it, we got into this battle, and I didn't understand it, but as I began to do the work, it was like, oh my God, here we go again, the grief. So. Zara, thank, I must thank you for sharing your story and writing your yeah. books, because you do help other parents like me. Okay, thanks. It's very kind of you to open up so much. Yes. Thank you. And I think everyone is expressing the same in the chat, Zara. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That's okay. Well, we are, as we always do, uh, we've run out of time. Um, uh, well, the time we said we would allow for this, but I think before we, we get into questions, um, it, it, I, I'd like to end with um, your tips, the things so if there were one or two things that you would want people to know, um, I know Zara, you've spoken about the depth of that grief and how it gets recycled and it knocks you for six at times, you know, where you might've thought you, yeah. So what are, the, what are the things you could say to people today that can be helpful? Because this grief exists, it doesn't matter how much of an, an amazing adoptive parent you are, family, how great your agency is in supporting families we know there's this primal wound so what are the things we can do that are going to be useful what what have you personally found that have been helpful debbie i know you've spoken so often about things that you've done with you in your family and i wonder if there's anything that comes to mind right now um i'm just looking at the things um we, so it's keep the topic of conversation open and start that conversation when the children are as young as possible. I know we're talking more about teenagers at the moment, but it's, it, you know, it's never too late to start that conversation. And if they don't want to talk, you can do what Holly Van Goulden suggests, which is pebbling. And you just mention things and let those ripples carry out. It's just making the adopted child aware that that conversation is open when they want to have it um help them with vocabulary to explain their feelings um uh that's some other notes that we can put put out maybe but um i think quite a big turning point for us was um the sense that for my daughter her early life she was not in control of anything that happened and it, it must be the same for um most relinquished children and um what we found worked a lot was as she was struggling to attend school because she found it so overwhelming and it was too big too noisy too many people too much work the expectations were too high um was i started to give some control back to her um and when she you know we, we as parents were expected to get our children into school um, and their education can suffer and just get them in and then school take it on from there but actually what I realized was you know this was becoming a mental health issue and if she was physically ill I wouldn't send her into school so if she's mentally ill and she, she can't face going in then maybe she actually needs that time off and so we, we moved to a point where um, we gave control back to her saying only you know how you feel you know if you think you can face the day go in you don't have to stay the whole day you can call and i'll come and pick you up so it was all about giving control back and giving lots of options so that she didn't feel trapped 
Um, I think that was probably the single biggest thing in the teenage years. I'd like to tell you my favorite question um, because it captures the uh, concerns that we've addressed here. My favorite question for people is what is it like to be you? Now you need to see that if we ask that question sincerely, we're pushing back on all these other things that get in the way. Denial is the big piece, but also expectations in the family that get in the way. The most important question we can ask is what is it like to be you? And that means to me that the most important variable in these conversations is empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy, empathy is getting into someone else's life experience with your curiosity and your ignorance. Put differently, you don't know what it's like to be another person. And when you ask the question, what is it like to be you? That's the invitation to a relationship. I love the question because it gets right to the core of what we need to do in terms of our relating with each other. What is it like to be you as an adoptee? Uh, Zara's really let us know. What, what is it like to be you um, as, as a, an adoptive parent trying to figure out how to respond to things that are so confusing? What is it like for you as a birth parent to relinquish someone and then spend so many years wondering and not knowing? What is it like to you is my favorite question. I think the most healing part is connecting with other adoptees and, and members of the triad you know that's what we call adoptive parents birth parents adoptees we're the triad and that for me going to my first adoption conference was finally walking in a room where everybody understood me and i didn't even have to say anything i knew i was understood and i think that goes back to the cellular memory because you know there are no words when we're babies so it stays in our cells there are no words that's Somebody explained cellular memory in a very simple way. The words are stored in the body, you know. And um, going into an adoption conference was where finally people were putting words to what I had thought all these years. And people like BJ Lifton, she wrote about the, um, you know, the shadow kingdom, the ghost kingdom, and how we we're all living in a house, and there's all these shadows that nobody's talking about. I mean, you know, I, I would think about the, the daughter that my parents never had. It's like I knew this daughter that my parents never had. Talk about ghost kingdom. I was picking up their grief and their loss, and I would compare myself with this perfect daughter that didn't exist which is just so weird. And you know, I would never tell anybody that, but then I could go into these conferences and go, wow, I'm not completely nuts. Maybe a little bit nuts, not totally nuts. So that's where a lot of the healing, and you know, I know I saw somebody, somebody saying, does the grief ever end? You know what? No, it doesn't, not for me, but it doesn't consume my life in the way that it used to and i am able to get on have a i have so much joy in my life and then i'll have old moments like that where you just feel it again or major you know milestones that come up but doesn't everybody it's been amazing it's been amazing listening to you i think we all feel really really honored to to have uh, heard your stories and the information that you've shared tonight I know Louise has been working super hard to keep abreast of all the questions that are coming up. Uh, some will be in the chat, some might have been sent privately. Um, Louise, this is your, your moment. Um, what are people wanting to know? Hi guys, so yeah, there's quite a big variety of questions. Um, I'm just, I've made a list and I'm just gonna go through sort of from the beginning. Um, there was a question that asked about how the age uh, when the adoptee is adopted, how that affects the attachment between the adoptee and the adoptive parents? I'll respond to that. Um, when, you re, when you are adopting a child, even at birth, um, that child is an experiencing self. Happiness, sadness, fear, safety, the child is an experiencing self. And so even in the earliest days of adoption, when you adopt an infant, 
that child has all these experiences that are forming its perceptions of its reality. As a child gets older, there are, you know, what, hundreds of thousands of experiences that the child has. And if you're adopting someone who is four or five or six years old, there's a whole bank of memories that have formed that child into the kind of person that he or she may be. So older adoptions are obviously more difficult. And acknowledging the history of that child is critically important. Uh, when parents try to make believe, adoptive parents try to make believe that that's not the case, uh, the, the attachment will always be compromised. I mean, one way to talk about adoptive struggles is to talk about compromised attachments that are so hard to, um, how do I say, complete it? But the age of a child is an important variable. That's what I'm saying. Thank you so much. I think there's, this kind of leads on to it, but um, there was also a question about further harm being caused um, when perhaps the ties are cut between an adoptee and their foster parents or other adults that they knew along the way. If you are, uh, Ronnie, are you going to answer that? No, you answer it, please. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, a lot of people are very for adoption. Personally, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not for the closed adoption at all. And I think that all the carers, whether you've been, you know, in foster care, I mean, obviously, if they're safe people, but I think that it's so important to keep all those threads open as much as possible. You know, I always say, like, as a mother, I can love all my children. I love them all. I can love lots of parents and lots of caregivers. I think sometimes that's the fear of the adoptive parent, which is, which is another kind of issue. But I think um, I, I would I would agree. I think it's really important. It's part of their their history. It's part of the roots and where they've come from. Um, so yeah, we've tried to forge links for um, for our daughter. You know where she came from. So we're in touch with one of her very early caregivers. Thank you so much. Um, so there was another question about um, whether there's been any research into a link between adoptees then experiencing uh, postnatal depression um, when they go on to have their own children. Well, I have to say, there really is not a lot of research about that. So when I was pregnant with my first kid, which is like 24 years ago now, <clears throat> I was, because I was experienced so, you know, so much stuff was coming up, cellular memory stuff was coming up for me. I was looking everywhere to see if I could find anything and I couldn't. So I took it upon myself to interview a whole bunch of other adoptee mothers um, to find out. And I asked them a lot of different questions and I was actually going to create a book just around that. But then I ended up adding it's a book I wrote many years ago mother me and I add um, their quotes actually throughout the book just to see if there were commonalities and I have to tell you it was unbelievable how many commonalities there were so yes I, I'm not saying we all have you know you were saying that it was uh, postnatal depression and I remember thinking I had postnatal depression after I had my son because you know so many feelings were coming up but my therapist at the time said no it's just grief it's just the natural grief that you would be feeling as an adoptee so I think it's really important not to label that like a couple of people are like, oh you just have postnatal depression how easy is it to just wipe it off as that again not wanting to go to no i'm grieving the loss of my mother this has come up even though i then knew my birth mother didn't make any difference um you know i was a new mother and i was now in touch with that so i think you know it's important that we help adult adoptee mothers because it can be so profound and they can think there's something wrong with them when really there isn't it's just a normal reaction to something that happened to us. I'd like to add a little example that kind of captures what you're saying, Zara. Um, I remember a, um, an adoptee who, um, when she gave birth to a little girl, who was her first, uh, first child, when the baby was born, the adoptee mother couldn't look at the baby. She couldn't lay her eyes to the eyes of this newly born infant. And, um, 
in exploring that, she learned about herself, that she had never seen any of her birth family, birth mom, birth dad, and she had no idea what the baby would look like, as if to say the genetics are at play here, and I don't know my birth, my birth parents' stories, and she was paralyzed in such a way that she couldn't look at the baby. F a fearful that the baby would not be good looking because of her negative ideas about her birth parents. What a horrible experience for this woman to go through in the very moments that she's giving birth. Mm -hmm. But it shows you how powerful those images are uh, in the recesses of the human heart, however you want to say it. But you know, it's funny, you reminded me, Ron, I dreamt that I was giving birth to a monster, <laughs> like this three-headed monster when I was pregnant. And I just was like, oh, I love it so much. So I knew that whatever I had, I'd be fine, like even in the dream. But it is, it's this thing that people don't get if they grow up and they just look like their family. You know, my three kids look alike. And I would just go on and on when they were little. Oh my God, look, they look alike, they look alike. And my husband at the time was like, uh, that's normal, you know, but it was so abnormal for me. And I know for other adoptees too. Yes. So we do go on about that, the likeness a lot, because it's like alien for us. Thank you so much. Um, there was another question as well about um, family constellation work and whether um, any of you guys can comment on the healing power of that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I can answer, <laughs> I, but I'm not one of the panelists. Obviously I was just a compare, but for the person who asked, I, I would say that um, I have a lot of experience of people that have, have looked at that and found it to be really, really useful. Um, so much so that recently um, I will share with you all that I have started my own um, uh, family um, uh, healing, looking at generations, that I come from that have experienced awful tragedies um, and awful situations and it has been incredible incredible and and with family constellation work you don't need to know the names you don't need to know the people so it, it works really well for adoptees because you know there was a, a, a mother and a father even if they didn't act those roles. So um, yes, I would encourage you, if, if you think that feels useful for you, it's a bit of a walk on the wild side for a lot of people. Um, but uh, if, that, if, if you feel drawn to that, I have to say I've heard lots of people have really benefited from it and I personally have found it um, quite useful. So um, what does Family Constellation? So it's looking at your ancestors and it's understanding their stories so that you can better understand yours. Um, so, uh, to, actually, Zara is like this amazing researcher. Um, it, I mean, the things that you've done, Zara, do you remember the time where you were handing out flyers in Little Italy, trying to, you know, do you know this man? I mean, <laughs> you know, if Zara... Found him eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when you're driven in that way, so, so Zara, you, I think you found out quite a lot about your family and you're in reunion um so so you have some of those questions that you always answered wanted answered answered but but for those of you where that's not possible it just is not doesn't exist you can still do constellation work um just acknowledging that there was there was a a, a female here and a male here there had to have been for you to be here thank you so much debbie um, so another question that came up was, I think somebody was asking, they're supporting a, a young adopted person and they're trying to communicate to their adoptive parents that this young person needs to acknowledge their grief. Um, I wonder if you guys have got any comments on that. Do you mean that um, a young, an adult is asking about conversations with his or her adoptive parents? So what i um what i've got from the question is the fact that so somebody is supporting um in supporting a family that has adoptive parents and adopted child and they're trying to get the adoptive parents to understand that the adoptive child has unacknowledged grief well it, what it's a very good illustration of what often happens um the, the challenge is to help the adoptive parents 
understand the experience of their adoptee child. And there are, I mean, one, one place to go there is to help them do, uh, do some reading on adoptive development, you know, in the various books that are available about that. Um, but the conversation needs to be such that the adoptive parents are open to the suffering of their child. See how I said it? Mm -hmm. They're open to the suffering of their adoptee child, then they can invite that child into a stronger attachment to them, which gives them gives that adoptee more strength to grow up and gives the adoptive parents the, uh, the, 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 the success of truly being helpful to a child that they love. So, you know, one, one, one place to go would be to read some of the books that are uh, available with regard to that. Starting with like the primal wound is, was the Bible it was published in 1993, but it has been the Bible for adoptive development uh, for 25, 30 years now. Thank you so much. So another question that we've got is asking about the perhaps specifically unique loss an adoptee might experience when a birth, a, when a adoptive parent um, dies. Well, I've had that experience. Um, I mean, I suppose it, you know, I can't really talk for everybody. Obviously, I can only talk myself. I mean, I had a really challenging relationship with my mother due to a lot of this uh, stuff that we've been talking about all evening. She had never dealt with her grief. And, um, you know, I was sort of working on mine. So, um, God, sorry, I'm like, um, you know, it's, it brought up a lot of stuff for me. It brought up a lot of stuff for me after she died. I definitely went back to that feeling of the child and the panic of the separation, which we talked about at the beginning. Um, and I was stunned. I was like, my God, I'm 43. No, she died like 12 years ago, whatever. And I was thinking, oh my God, how can I be feeling this way when I've done so much work? Um, but I think it is, and maybe Ron can speak more about that stuff, but I think um, it's such a complicated relationship. I think mother and daughter relationships are pretty complicated, but I think it's extra you know, and I've heard other, other adoptees talk about this. It's, it's very layered, very, very layered. I mean, if there's anything specific they want to ask, you know, but what we were talking about, my mother, you know, the infertility, the fact that I could have children, my mother's, you know, being of the generation which she didn't have Debbie, the support, who knows? But I think that an adoptee, because, we have such a time of attaching to our adoptive mothers, they become um, like our saviors. You know, they have saved us from dying. That's sort of what it feels like. So then when they go, there's still that feeling around it, even as an adult. And that's why I talk so much about um, the lifelong impact. I think all of us who are in this little conversation tonight, we all honor your emotions and we honor your tears. And we thank you for being so vulnerable and forthcoming to make the point that becoming relinquished and adopted and growing up is really a challenge and it is quite complicated and we carry our stories. And the adoptive parents have this challenge of um, helping adoptees speak their own truth. And, you know, even your tears speak your truth about what a struggle it has been. But I think all of us understand that you're demonstrating what we all need to pay attention to. Yeah. There's, there's sadness. There's anger. There's a, a variety of emotions that are part of development. And you are attending to them and you're showing us how to do it correctly. So thank you, Zara. Thank you, Ron, for speaking on behalf of, I think, everybody here. Thank you. So there was one other question, um, and this was about um, looking at the support that's available for birth parents um, after adoption um, or the care proceedings have taken place. And 
again, I'm not sure um, who would be able to um, comment on that, but it's come up a few times. You know, that comes up a lot in reference to adoption agencies who um, commit themselves to post-adoption serv post services so that there's an ongoing uh, resource uh, with the adoption agency. Now, we have that, you know, with those kind of agencies, there's all kinds of different kinds of adoptions that don't include an agency. But th that's the place where I would start just in terms of wondering how to support adoptive parents um, after um, a child is born or received. I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Debbie, you always you always speak so eloquently uh, of the lessons that you've learned and the support you've had. W were there in, was there support that you would recommend to people today? Um, yeah, we'll, we can put it in the um, information that Louise is going to put out. But um, certainly, I, you know, um, struck a chord with me when Zara said about joining uh, adoptee support groups. Um, you know we've joined um support groups for uh, families who adopt um and there's you know charities around and you can you know to meet like-minded people is just absolutely amazing and you you know it makes you realize you're not on your own and you can share these experiences and get support um the organization that i'm part of is called catch all and it supports families who have adopted from done into into country adoptions um, so, um, if anybody's interested in that, that information will be going out. Um, it originated with families who had adopted from China, but we now include everybody who's been involved in inter-country adoption from anywhere in the world, and everybody would be very welcome to come and join us, either as adoptive parents or as adoptees themselves. We've recently got some young adults joining us. Um, which is brilliant they found us and it's fantastic um, but there's also charities like uh, Adoption UK I'm sure contacting them would be a source of support um, and I also wanted to say as well you know if you're if you know if you've got issues with your child not to hesitate to get support from professionals as well so we you know when we were worried about our daughter's mental health and we thought the anxiety was too high you know we went to the gp got referral for cams etc you have to keep pushing away you know you don't get what you need first time around it takes a while to work out what the issue is and what the best route forward is but eventually we got um referred through the post adoption support team so that's another team to go through in your local authority post adoption support and the combination of CAMS and post option support brought us to um, Link Bernardo's who do some amazing therapeutic work called My Life. Um, and it's just working through where you've come from, where you are now, what the future might hold. Um, and it's done age appropriately. It's brilliant. Um, and I think at school, um, you know, we've had a not We've had quite a good, we've had a good relationship with schools in that at the beginning of each year I always did notes for each form tutor because I thought if they don't know her background how can they support her so I would bang on about it every year and you know word get, would get round but when, when the kids get to secondary school it's really hard in a bigger environment for all those subject teachers to know all this about each child they can't so you're really reliant on working with the form tutor and the head of year and that's the pastoral support route and they can they can really care for your child but they do not understand this they don't and you've got to get to the right person in the school and i think one or two years ago somebody maybe here tonight might be able to confirm that but there was um, a role created called uh, the designated teacher for looked after and previously looked after children and once we got put in touch with that person it made all the difference so from our daughter being overwhelmed with school and school trying to help by taking out a lesson here and a lesson there to shorten the days this person turned it completely round pushed it to one side and said 
what do you think you can manage? So we started with what our daughter could manage and we started to build up from there. Um, and it's just getting to the right people. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, I actually wanted to say that I think the um, there was also a question about support for birth, birth parents um, after the child has been relinquished. And if you guys know of any support available for the birth parents. Well, I know in America there's Concerned United Birth Parents and they, they might know more what's going on. I'm not sure if they have a, um, a group in England, but they're, uh, for anyone from America, they're an amazing organisation. And actually we all ended up going, you know, adoptees go, adoptive parents can go too, but it's, it's formed by birth parents. And another thing that's so wonderful in these groups is, you know, it was the first time I'd ever um, sat with other birth parents. You know, mm. I had so much anger towards birth parents. And I, then I found that, oh my goodness, I actually like some of these women, you know, so that really helped with my healing. I mean, we laugh about how angry I was at the beginning. I, I hate all birth mothers, you know, and then you realize they're really lovely people. So all of that is so like Ron saying, who are you? What's it like to be you? You know, I had to listen to the birth mother. What's it like rather than just be angry? And then I could feel more compassion for my birth mother, etc. And adopt Thank you so much for that, um, Zara. I'm just checking and seeing if there's um, any other questions that I think, um, I think we might have covered most of the questions that came up at the moment. Um, While you're scrolling through, I just want to respond uh, to a, a, a point Karen Jenner raised about needing to educate doctors. Um, one of the things that Ollie does, we try and always create a fully funded training for educators for uh, the police, for all first responders, and uh, definitely for our A&E staff, um, because they are often, uh, in fact, our police probably attend and support more um, uh, people who are suicidal than anybody else. Yeah. And none of these people, none of these people get trained in uh, mental health necessarily or suicide prevention and I, I can be really really clear about that because I have personally taught over 45 A&E staff um, and they are so thrilled um, to, to have this knowledge so it, it's not just about adoption but it's suicide as well um, so we're, <laughs> we're doing it and, and we will carry on talking about adoption um, and, and supporting this as much as well possible. talking about relinquishment you know I think you know I'm looking at some of the questions no no but it's new for me to think about it that way too because people are saying how do we go forward and it's so much in the language you know, yeah. I think it is more powerful. Like we, we were talking a couple of days ago, I'll just say to all, all, all you people listening and on the panel, we were having a little chat the other day. And, you know, as an adoptee, nobody says, oh, I'm so sorry that your mother, you know, you lost your mother, right? They just say how lucky you are. Whereas if my mother had died, they, well, I mean, when my mother did die, everyone was like, I'm so sorry your mother died, right? So those are the differences. But if we start wording it as I was relinquished as a baby, my mother gave me away, I didn't know who my parents were, I bet you people would go, hmm, huh. you know, they might start thinking about it in a different way. And then, yes, the adoption piece is a separate piece, but we still have a lot of educating to do because people don't want, I don't know why, they just think that babies don't remember anything, you know, so we have a lot and that children get over stuff and that the kids forget and all of this and it just blows my mind but somehow we have to start with that basic info i don't know i've been doing this for a long time and i'm still like i don't know i don't know what else to do <laughs> louise were there any other questions that you wanted to bring to the panel so i i, I think that that's most of the questions that came up. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Well, um, if anybody is, if this is your last moment to type very furiously if you had any further thoughts. Um, but while you're doing that, I, I, I would just like to thank everybody for being here, for giving up your evening and joining us. I think this has been a really important conversation. You, you may not have agreed with everything that was said, but you definitely had a lot of food for thought. 
um, and I can see from most of the comments that, that it, it's been quite insightful. Um, Louise has, I think, already said she, she's going to be compiling a great uh, resource pack to send out to you. Um, so you'll be giving that soon, a uh, certificate of, an, of attendance. If there's anything particularly that comes to you later, you've got our email so you can you can send in your questions, but also any resources that you want to share with, with everyone that was here. We'll, we'll get that out to everybody. Um, any last words from our panel? Uh, I, I, know, I know that I keep going back to that statistic um, in that university study that uh, uh, adoptees are four times more likely to be suicidal than their non-adopted peers. And I keep thinking about the, what adoptees carry because of that. And I see how that relates so directly. Uh, when, when you can't have the feelings that you really have, you're, you're set up for trouble. And um, I see the connection that you've been making between feeling suicidal that you're, you've, all, you've lost all your options. That's kind of what that means. And so what we are doing today is um, thinking it through in such a way that people can see there are options um, to, uh, to, to, to make good use of. So adoption, uh, compromised attachment and suicide, there's a relationship there that is very important and I think we've I think we've captured that today. Somebody just quickly wrote about how do you get adopted parents to uh, acknowledge their own grief you know I mean it, again I just think very gently suggest suggest it I mean how do we make anybody do anything we have to just very sort of introduce that maybe there's a possibility they might have feelings around that. You know, some adoptive parents are very open. I've heard an adoptive mother be say, becoming an adoptive mother did not make me a fertile mother. I was still infertile. You know, that was her journey of really acknowledging it. But I think we just have to, um, you know, if we can find that teachable moment to say, you know, have you ever thought that maybe you, you feel sad you didn't have your own natural child? Like, they probably feel ashamed to admit that, you know, especially when it's, uh, especially when there's such a clash sometimes. Sarah, I'm, I'm sure that there are people here today who are in a position who could answer, but I just wonder, Debbie, with your experience, was the focus on how you support the, was their focus on you as the adoptive mother there was in the early training, um, they did start, they actually started with, you know, adoption comes out of, of loss. And they, they did talk about, you know, the, um, the birth family's loss of their child, that um, usually the adoptive parents, you know, have come to this through infertility. And, and obviously the adopted child has lost their, their first family. So that was acknowledged right at the very beginning. That was the way in. They used that as the way in. So, you know, think about your losses right. and, and try and use that as a way in to your, what your child might be, might be feeling. I, th I think the trouble is that, you know, when you hear that, it's so theoretical and you're in a classroom and you're on a course and you're ticking a box to get a piece of paper so you can start your home study and things. Right. And, you know, I think for some people, it, you know, it's, it's very easy to lose sight of that in, you know, busy family life. It's really easy to lose sight of all of those things that have been touched on. And I think those waves that, that Zara spoke about before, I'm sure, Zara, that your adoptive mother was in no way prepared for the feeling she had when you had your children mm. and she became a grandma. Mm. I'm sure she was just as surprised. And it was so sad, you know, because I had a miscarriage in between my first and second. And I, I think I told you, I, um, the first thing my mother said to me was, well, at least you had a baby. Mm. You know, like, who says that? And I knew, like, oh. took my breath away, but I knew this was her pain. And then when I got pregnant with my third really quick, I didn't tell her because I thought she's going to find it so difficult that I so easily had these babies. How sad is that for both of us? 
you know, I miss that out. And then you can't talk to your birth mother about my birth because my birth mother had so much pain around when I had a child because then it brought up her stuff. So often we can feel quite alone as adoptee mothers. But thank goodness for friends and people around that, you know, we can ask all the questions, you know, that our birth, you know, if your ad adopted mother had not had a pregnancy. And it just makes me very sad, really, you know, because again, it's that unacknowledged grief that nobody, you know, things could have been different if we had all understood <clears throat> what was going on. I suppose that's why I'm passionate about talking about it. So maybe it helps other people not have to go through their whole lives like that. Absolutely. And I think what you've done this evening, everybody, thank you so much because the conversations that you've started, I'm sure people are going to go away from this evening um, thinking about so much, thinking about how they can take what they've heard um, and, and how they can use that. Wh which reminds me one more point, which is when Louise emails you, she's also going to send you a very, very short survey. Uh, it's really important that we get feedback so we know what was important to you, what felt clunky and you didn't enjoy. Um, but it would, it would be very, we would be very grateful if you could complete that and send it back to us because it allows us to know what we're getting right and, and, and more importantly what you need to hear. Um, we have another talk um, with an, another absolutely incredible panel on the 30th of October which is looking at autism and, and again the, the, the higher rates of suicide with, with um, with autistic people if that is relevant to you please 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 do sign up for that talk as well thank you everyone so much for being here i'm going to invite you all to um disconnect from this call except the panelists because i need to say hello and thank you thank you everybody thank you everyone thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye.